the name Gennesaret. It's Galilee. That's all it is. It's a fancier name. Sometimes you'll see the Sea of Gennesaret. It's the Sea of Galilee. So we're still in the Galilean area there. And people knew Jesus was coming. They found out. And they're laying people on the side of the road who are sick. And all they wanted to do was basically touch the hem of his garment. And he healed more people of their infirmities than I can even imagine. I think we're guilty a lot of times of thinking that the only miracles Jesus performed and the only people Jesus healed were those that are recorded for us in Scripture. We're not even given a total here. Just can you imagine walking down the road and, and people laying in beds just reaching out? You know, they didn't even have to reach out. Did you know that? It was the faith that healed them. And all they had to do was believe. But, you know, today we live in a world where you have a lot of people claiming different things. A few years ago, there was a denomination that offered $100,000 to anyone who could come forward and prove that they were healed by a faith healer. As far as I know, that $100,000 is still in the bank. No one ever came forward to claim that money. Why? Because there were no witnesses. No witnesses. But you see, it amazes me today, of all the people who listen to the propaganda, who listen to these, well, the propaganda, I'll leave it at that. They believe when there are no witnesses to verify what's being said. They just take one person's word and get excited about it. Now, the difference I want you to see is if someone had made that offer during the time of Jesus, they wouldn't have been able to pay all the people who came forward and all the witnesses who would have been with them to verify the fact that Jesus Christ could heal. He's God. Jesus was genuine. His healings were real. He is the great physician. I'm going to tell you, no one in this building today or anyone who will be listening has never been healed by a doctor. Never. Jesus healed you. And if you weren't healed, it's because He had a purpose behind it. A doctor may give you medicine. He may say, this is wrong with you, but the healing is of the Lord. I guess the proof's in the pudding as the saying goes. And so the enemies of Jesus could not attack Him because of His healings or because of His miracles because of all the witnesses. You know, Jesus didn't just go behind the door and do a little something. He sat out in the open. He preached in the open. He performed miracles in the open. He healed in front of witnesses. Every one of Jesus' miracles were witnessed by somebody who would verify it. The healings were real. They could be proved. So the enemies of Jesus had to find another way to attack Him. Another way to try to bring Him down. And since they couldn't attack the miracles, they were on the lookout for any possible thing, no matter how small, where they could attack him, take him down, destroy his ministry. This is an important point because we see a very important word that starts chapter 7. Remember I read from chapter 6 into chapter 7. Then. We're told that then. Then what? Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. Then, after all the miracles, everything Jesus had done, then here come these fellows. We need to understand now that many changes were taking place at this time period. This is the intertestimonial period. It's the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Things were beginning to happen. Those years were some of the most eventful years in the history of the nation of Israel. Sometime between the Babylonian captivity and the return to the land, continuing into that period between the Testaments, there developed a new group, new groups and new parties of men who are not mentioned in the Old Testament. These groups were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and Herodians. Now, we need to look at these fellows just for a quick bit so you know what's going on here. <coughs> the scribes, had a good beginning. Ezra was a scribe, probably the founder of the group. They were professional expounders of the law, of the Word of God. 
And when they started, that's what they were doing. They were looking at the Word of God and taking it as it should be. They worked hard at keeping the, the Word of God in the right and proper context. But by the time that Jesus came, at His first coming, the scribes had become hair splitters. More concerned about the letter of the law than the heart of the law. By the way, hair splitting is also a great problem that we have today. It continues. Over the past 50 or 60 years, especially, there has been a lot of hair splitting in our country. And the hair splitting in regard to legal and philosophical interpretations that, that was never intended with the original writers of our laws in this country. And it's the result of liberal teaching in law school, just like the same problem you have in church today, liberal teaching from the pulpit. And let me say this, the reason we find our legal system and our political system in such a mess today is because of hair splitting. That's exactly what happened to religion in the Lord's day, hair splitting. <coughs> and we also see the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees also had a good beginning. They begin with an effort to defend the Jewish way of life against foreign influences. Of course, the foreign influence is great. That's what caused a lot of problems in the past. I guess you could say their motto is, we don't care what other people say, we are going to follow the Lord. Wow, what a novel idea that is, isn't it? To follow the Lord. The Pharisees wanted to bring in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. But you know what? When Jesus offered them the kingdom, they refused. They were looking for it all this time, trying to do things to bring it in, and then the doorway to the kingdom stands before them and offers them the kingdom. They don't want any part of it. But by that time, they had turned away from the true meaning of Scripture and began to follow man-made religion, rabbinical teachings. <clears throat> the Sadducees were a group that were made up of wealthy, socially-minded individuals. These men had no spiritual depth whatsoever, and they desired to get rid of tradition. They also rejected the supernatural, such as angels. They were opposed to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees accepted the supernatural. They expect, accepted angels. But these men also rejected the resurrection. Jesus asked them about that in Scripture, by the way. The Sadducees were similar to the Greek uh, Epicureans. In other words, they were troublemakers too. And the Herodians were a party in, in Jesus' days who arose, arose in politi they were political optimists. They always wanted, you know, we've always had these people in history. They're always there. They're trying to, if they think the wind's blowing this way, they go here. If it's going, they go whatever. You know. Their basic motivation was to keep the Herods on the throne. I think this rather quick look at these groups will give you an idea of what Jesus was facing when they came out to him. Then came together the Pharisees and certain scribes. Now notice they came from Jerusalem. They made a trip up to Galilee. The word of God that Jesus had been preaching and Jesus' fame had stretched all the way down to Jerusalem, all over the country. And so these men are going up there. The miracles of Jesus seem to be the reason. They've been drawn by Jesus' miracles. They want to see what's going on up there. And his teaching also, I'm sure, had a great deal to do with it. It was for this purpose that these Pharisees and scribes came all the way from Jerusalem to Galilee where Jesus was ministering. As I said, they couldn't attack Jesus because of his miracles, too many witnesses. They couldn't attack him because of his healings, too many witnesses. These things have been proven. They needed something to hold against it. In their mind, there was a crisis arising over the ministry and the person of Jesus Christ. So they're going to attack using a little different approach. I find it interesting, though. I think last week we talked about the disciples after their ministry trip, that mission trip. They came back to Jesus and told him everything that had happened, all the things. Now, Unbelievers, the scribes and the Pharisees are coming to gather around Jesus. What are they going to hear when they come around Jesus? The Word of God. He's going to give them the same word he'd give anybody else. He's going to tell them. 
what the Bible, what we call the Bible says. Even unbelievers are drawn to Jesus, but their hearts are not right. So the Pharisees and the scribes, oh, they see something and they attack the disciples about eating with unwashed hands. Their claim was for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the traditions of the elders. They make sure they wash everything, including the cups and the pots and the vessels and the tables. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's it's really good, but uh, you knew without a doubt there was going to be a confrontation between the Lord Jesus Christ and his followers and the Pharisees and their followers. So two different groups heading in two different directions. The first group made up of Jesus' friends, his followers, those who loved him. The second group made up of his enemies, the scribes, the Pharisees. They want to do everything they can in an effort to destroy Jesus. They actually hate Jesus. They do. They want to, what they really want to do is kill him. It's always been that way. 2,000 years later, it still hasn't changed. Today, there are still the two same groups of people walking on the earth, those who trust Jesus Christ and those who reject him. Now, I want to get a little bit personal for a moment. What group do you belong to? There's only two choices. You're probably saying, well, why are you asking me? And I'm here in church service, and doesn't that make it obvious? No, it doesn't. I'm sorry, it doesn't make it obvious to me at all. The, your response to the question makes all the difference in the world, all, your, all the difference for all eternity. Now, the question was not, are you a member of the church, of this church or any other church? It's not about have you gone through a, any type of ceremony. It's all about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Which group, and there are only two, do you belong? And that, that's all. That's the important question. Question you have to answer. The only, one, only person who really knows is you and the Lord. Well, we can be sure that the scribes and the Pharisees were obviously a very special and select delegation that came from Jerusalem. They didn't just get up that morning and say, well, you know what? Let's go on up to Galilee. We can lay on the beach and take a picnic lunch and enjoy ourselves. They didn't go up there for that. They went up to Galilee to spy on Jesus. They were sent there with a message, with a purpose. And to do it, their purpose was to do everything in their power to find a fault, no matter how small they could find with his followers or him. Yes, these men were hand-picked opponents they were sent to trap the Lord. You know what? It amazes me as I go through the reading scriptures over and over again. These men never learn. How many times do they confront Jesus only to walk away shaking their heads? You know, there's no doubt in the manner in which Jesus defended himself. He always defended himself with powerful proof that he, that he, of his deity. Over in John 7, 46, Never man spake like this man. That was their report back. They were, they were sent out to attack him. And they came, this man says things I've never heard before. He's incredible. It wasn't too hard, though, for the scribes and the Pharisees to find some fault with Jesus or his disciples because the Lord entirely ignored their traditions. I said their traditions. He was not worried about man-made traditions. What was the tradition of those men? The Pharisees, of course, we talked about washing all the time there. And the Pharisees, though, were not merely attacking the disciples because of a breach of etiquette and not washing their hands. They attacked the Lord for not having his disciples keep the traditions that they had set forth. You see, when he attacks, they attack the disciples, you're attacking the Lord. When, you know, when people attack Christians, they're not attacking you, they're attacking the Lord. When people say something about you, about your Christianity, it's about the Lord. And that's the same thing here. You know, those traditions were only their interpretation of the Old Testament. Mark explains for the benefit of the Romans. Remember, this book was written primarily for a Roman audience. <coughs> and 
and I might add also for us, because a lot of people today don't dig in and find out about the traditions and lifestyles of those days. And you know, he talks about this custom of ceremonial washing that it was peculiar to Israel, and it was. Indeed, God gave Israel a great amount of information about cleansing. In Leviticus, we find a great deal of instruction about cleansing. That was important because God was teaching Israel something. God's always trying to teach us something. Sometimes we're a little hard-headed and we don't get it. The great lesson that was really given to us in Leviticus was that a sinner has to be cleansed before he could enjoy fellowship with the Holy God. There it is. Has nothing to do with washing plates or, or saucers or anything, but cleansing yourself. And you realize when you have to do it over and over and over again, like the sacrifices, there's something wrong with you. There's more that needs to be done. But the Pharisees took what the Lord said in the Moses' writings and built a great tradition that was supposed to be their interpretation of the Mosaic law. And some of them even contended that Moses actually gave them the traditions when he gave them the law. I call this make it up as you go along theology. Years ago, there was a TV show, All in the Family. Remember All in the Family? I call this Archie Bunker theology because Archie just made it up as he went along. That's what these fellows were doing. Just make it up. So over a period of time, the result was that the traditions actually became the interpretation of the law. You see what happens? The Word of God gets pushed over here and the Word of man takes its place. And that's exactly what we see here. And we see it today too. People have writings and they just want to elevate them. Some of the traditions give it in detail. They would ceremonially wash the cups and the pots and the brazen vessels and the tables. Man-made tradition. And it was a burdensome sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't wash your hands, you shouldn't wash your face, you shouldn't wash your dishes, but it has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Man-made traditions are burdensome. And they start that the law was burdensome enough. And when you add to it, the weight will eventually break your back. You see, it was nothing more than an outward performance. And that's what people like. People seem to think that they need to help God. Even some believers are like that. Well, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I need to do... No, you don't. You just need to serve Him. You don't need to do anything else. You're saved. But no buts to it. But people want to work. They want to do something else. By doing this cleaning and washing in front of everybody, it made them look so holy and so righteous even though it was not Scripture, but rather what they, emphasis here on man, commanded people to do. It became a look-at-me type of religion. Oh, I am so good. Look at what I'm doing. I just follow the law. I follow the letter of the law. And there's the problem. The letter of the law does not need to be obeyed. It's the heart of the law. Why are you doing it? Well, I'm doing it so people know that I'm a holy person. That's no good. I'm doing it because I believe in God and He wants me to do what's right. That's what's supposed to be. You know, it's interesting. The word used for washing is actually baptism. In other words, they baptize the cups, the pots, the religious objects, even the tables. The baptism. It really points us to the ritualism of what they were doing. What we need to see here is that this was now a religion with a vengeance. And this type of religion exists in many forms and names today. It hasn't. The names changed. The idea behind it hasn't. You know, it's easy to see that a person could get so involved in going through the ritual of religion, they would forget what the whole purpose of the law was for. And people get so involved in their works they ignore the Word of God. You know, Satan loves that. He loves it when you get so involved with trying to be somebody 
that you forget to read your Bible. You forget to study the Word. You forget to pray because you're so busy having people look at you. They get involved and ignore the Word. The purpose of the man-made religion was that a person must be made right with God before a relationship can be established. Which means that, what? No relationship would ever be possible, would it? If you had to get, make yourself righteous and holy before you had a relationship with the Lord, you never had one. Because we're all sinners. And we still find this kind of thing today. Far too many people argue points of religion when it is the person of Jesus Christ and your personal relationship with Him that should be our concern. Again, Satan loves it when people, even Christians, argue about well, this, that, or the other. Well, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Well, your focus is not on the Lord anymore. Satan's having a whirlwind of a time now with the pandemic. Oh, worry about that. Worry about worry. Focus on the Lord. When things get to focus on Him. So the Pharisees make that accusation. Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? They need to understand that, again, when they attacked and accused the disciples, they were actually accusing Jesus because they were His followers. And let me tell you what, Jesus, I, don't you love Jesus? I mean, I know we love Him because He's our Savior, but don't you love the way he, He's not politically correct? Don't you look? He says the word of God and he speaks straight forward. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't deal with these men in a tender manner. Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. Now I can see the hair on the back of their neck stick up right here. That juggler veins probably pushed against their collar. You hypocrites. This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus turns to the Word of God and it's a wonderful lesson for us. You honor me with your lips. What's well, easy to do? Where's your heart? Your heart's stone. You don't give me any of your heart, none of your love. Stay in the Word and only in the Word and avoid the things of the world. Scripture, only Scripture. That was the keynote speech, the keynote words of the Reformation. Because before that, you only heard what the Roman church wanted you to hear. You don't need a Bible. Scripture, only Scripture. Don't listen to the traditions of men. Not, no gentle response. You hypocrites. A hypocrite is one who's acting the part, two-faced. It's the word that we, of course, for actor on the stage. He just changed masks to change parts. They were pretending, so to speak, they were pretending to be so holy and righteous, and they weren't. They were counting on some type of religious ritual, and they never experienced the reality of God's Word. Yes, this, the Pharisees and the scribes' lips and their hearts were so different that they could actually be two different people. Their lips are this fellow over here, and their hearts this fellow over here, and they can't get it together. You know, two different folks. They had no more of a heart concern than a ventriloquist dummy sitting on his knee. No heart concern. But they want people to see them. And there are many people today who are just going through a ritual in church. Your heart must be involved if there's genuine salvation. Listen to Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession made unto salvation. You have to have a right heart. <clears throat> what you say doesn't matter. It's what comes from here and out. That's what counts. People are still involved today in creeds and public worship and dress and even separation. And all of these things easily become a matter of tradition and not a direct and personal dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus charges them 
<clears throat> the scribes and the Pharisees, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Here again, you worship me with your doctrine, your teaching. <clears throat> That's what doctrine means. You should be teaching the word of God. That's your responsibility. You are the teachers of the law. Their worship, excuse me, has simply become following rules and regulations. And that means that they had actually substituted their personal ideas, their personal opinions for the Word of God. What they think rather than what God says. And when the Word of God is removed, there is a major problem because if you don't have the Word of God, there's no salvation. There's, if you are saved and you reject the Word of God, there's no growth and there's no discernment because biblical doctrine goes out the window and the church becomes as dead as four o'clock. Doctrine is important. What is doc doctors teaching? What does the Bible teach? Now Jesus sets forth the whole issue for them, verses seven and eight. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and the like. Well, full well ye reject the commandments of God that ye may keep your own tradition. Jesus just goes right after them. Why aren't you staying in the Word? You want me to tell you the problem with the church universal today? It's not in the Word. They're so easily swayed by the winds of tradition, the winds of this, this man or that people thought a man. You know, the Pharisees and scribes are busy substituting tradition for the Word of God. Today happens the same thing. <clears throat> it's a fact that tradition may actually be good and, and may have been established for a very good purpose. But tradition becomes evil when it is substituted for the Word of God in later generations. And that's what happens. It's like a piece of gossip. If you start up, if you whisper a gossip, a piece of gossip over here, and you whisper to the next person who is the next person, by the time it gets back to me, it won't even sound like what started. That's the way this tradition is. It may have started out good, but after a generation and generation passed in, it's turned into something evil. I personally believe that this is the reason so many denominations have departed from the Word of God today. First, they substituted some creed for the Word of God. And that creed was looked at as authoritative as the Word of God. And then somebody would write something because it leads to more false teaching. And they liked that book, so they took that book and they said, this book is just as important as the Word of God, maybe more important. And before long, the Word of God gets way over here. And they begin teaching what some man says. The result is terrible. Before long, the Word of God will go right out the window. It's happened again and again and again. It's happening today. Look at the cults out there in the world today. Each one of them has some man-written book that they use. Some book, some man wrote, and that they, well, they gather together. That's what they read. And they take the Word of God and they substitute words around to make it fit the creeds of their men. But you know, without the Bible, without the Word of God, you have nothing. Absolutely nothing. So Jesus takes one of their traditions. He does just one. He could probably take thousands, but he took one. And he spoke about it. For Moses said, honor thy father and mother. Boy, that's simple. Honor your father and mother. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. This is what the men were actually doing at that time. The fact is Moses had said in the law by direct revelation of God himself that they were to honor their father and mother. The first promise of the Ten Commandments, first commandment with a promise that your days may be long upon the land. It was also a death sentence, wasn't it? But the man-made tradition that they had by this point that they could escape biblical responsibility. 
in their interpretation, if a man didn't want to help his parents in their old age, <clears throat> or if they were needy and destitute, they could dedicate their possessions to the priest of the temple, and it was called a corbin, a gift. And when that man died, his estate went to the temple, went to the priest there, and he was relieved of his responsibility to his parents. That's what Jesus is talking about. Your traditions, how evil they are. <clears throat> you get out from under the commandment. When the man died, he just gave it away. Where is that described in Scripture? Can anybody, I'll give about $100,000 and you show me that. I don't have $100,000, so don't claim it. You can't anyway. It's not there. You know, make up all the rules you want. It doesn't change the Word of God. Jesus explained that if making it up as you go along destroys the world with the Word, He says, you suffer Him no more to do aught for His father or His mother. You have made up your rules and regulations and you don't care if your mom and dad are dying over there. You don't care if they don't have anything to eat. You still have your possessions. And when you die, you don't care because you're giving it away then. And you shirk your responsibility. They're made up traditions free men from following God's commands. They turn to sin by turning away from the Word of God. Jesus makes the result of this plain, doesn't He? Making the Word of God of none effect through your traditions which ye have delivered and many such thing like things do ye. Jesus said your traditions are wicked. They're, they contradict the intent of the law of God which says you are to honor your father and mother. Here again, what part of thou shalt don't thou understand? Thou shalt honor your father and mother. I don't want to do that. We see it today to a same time. They honor their father and mother today by moving back in with them so mom and dad can take care of them and maybe they can inherit. But if they're out on their own, it's, it's sad to see that people don't do that even today. So Jesus answered the Pharisees and scribes accusation about uncleanliness. Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering to him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. You see, Jesus is distinguishing now that which is external and that which is internal. It's pointing out what is real. Your faith, or as some people refer to it, your religion, is nothing that you can rub on like calamine lotion on a poison ivy. Your religion is not something you can eat or refrain from eating. That's legalism, which stems from man-made tradition, rules, and regulations. Now, when Jesus entered into the house, after talking to the, these Pharisees and scribes, you notice that Pharisees and scribes are not, don't say anything. They have nothing to say. Every time Jesus confronts these fellows, answers them, they just kind of step back, look at each other. They're on their way back to Jerusalem. What are we going to report? Well, we'll make something up as we get there. But they're not going to answer. They can't. They know Jesus is right. They'll never admit it, but they know He's right. So when He comes into the house, here come the disciples. Lord, would you explain that parable to us? <laughs> Point is this, that whatsoever thing from without entereth into a man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into the heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. That which cometh out of a man, that defileth a man. I can hear you, my friends. It's not what you put in, it's what comes out. It doesn't matter. Should you wash your hands? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. That's not going to defile you. But what's in this heart is going to come up, it's going to come out. It's going to speak those things. So Jesus tells him in no uncertain terms, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. From the heart. Remember, we're talking about they're giving their lip service. Their heart is another way. 
Those men who were so concerned about having clean hands and pots and pans and tables and everything else, their heart was as dirty as it could be. They were defiled by what's coming out. If you're one of the few people who still read the morning newspaper, I'm sure that you can find out that man is just like Jesus said here. Just in the last 24 hours, regardless of where you might be living, you see these things Jesus talks about. Evil thoughts, for example. That speaks for itself, doesn't it? The Bible says the imagination of the thoughts of this heart was on evil continually. That hadn't changed. Sadly, even believers have those evil thoughts. He talks about adulteries and fornications, unlawful sexual acts, unlawful sexual relations. I know the world says it's okay to participate, but Jesus, call, Jesus calls it evil, wicked, and sinful. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Here again, what part of thou shalt not? Don't people understand? Murder. You know, anger is also murder. Just how often do you get angry with someone? How often have you been angry at someone going down 460 and murdered them in your heart? Jesus, that's Jesus talking about, our, our standard is pretty high up here now, you know. You know, there's thefts. You know, loafing on the job can be a theft. You know, there are many ways of stealing beside the obvious. Robbing someone or going to a store taking something. You know, when a child disobeys his parents, that's theft because he is stealing their authority. That's, that's the way the world is, isn't it? Covetousness. That's grasping and greediness for material things and position. Placing the things over the world of the world over the things of God. And you desire to possess them more than you desire to possess the Lord. This sin causes so many people to do evil things. Uh, they want to possess things that are not theirs, and that includes husbands and wives and the physical things of this world. Wickedness, all the acts that are intended to hurt people. This includes, by the way, gossip. And that includes also starting rumors. It's all, wicked. all these things are designed to, to hurt people. I'm going to get even with them. You just watch. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll do something to hurt them. That's what we're talking about. This includes, and of course, deceit. Pretend to, that the pretense that people put up. This includes being a hypocrite, saying one thing and doing the opposite. Lasciviousness, that's sensuality. Engaging in all sorts of wickedness in a sensual, a sensual manner. Evil eye. You know what that is? That's envy. Jesus said, envy comes out of the heart. They have more than I do. So I despise them for it. I want what they have. You know that this evil eye, this envy, is the foundation for socialism and communism. I hate that person because he has what he's earned and I want it. That's it. I want what you have. It's not fair, as they say. Or uh, I really like the way they say, it's not fair, but that's what it is. It's envy, jealousy. Blasphemy is not only slander against God, it's slander against man. I don't really have to comment much on this one either. But that is the world. That's what the world does today and every day. It blasphemes God and pride. God hates pride. Did you know that? Pride is... The sin that is so terrible. It's pride that keeps people from saying, I'm a sinner. It's pride that keeps people coming to salvation. It's pride that keeps people from doing what the Lord wants them to do. And foolishness. You know, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So you're acting that way. It's acts done without respect for God or for man. Doesn't that pretty much describe the world today? Jesus just described our world. If you take the newspaper today, for anybody who still reads it, maybe you have a birdcage, maybe use it for that, but if you read what's in there or listen to the news, 
You see this. 2,000 years and Jesus is telling us what happened today. These are the things that come out of the heart of man. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. It's that simple. I said, there's only two kinds. You're either an enemy of Jesus or a friend of Jesus. You belong to Him or you don't. But regardless, your heart is sinful. And there's only one way of salvation. That's Jesus Christ. Ye must be born again. And when we talk about being born again, I'm talking about being baptized. Not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Baptism is just a ritual. A lot of people have been baptized and they go into the water a sinner and they come out a wet sinner. The only difference, you must be born again. The first time you were born physically and you, your heart is all these things Jesus listed, you have to be born a second time spiritually and be washed clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. You must be born again. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'm sure we can all see the traditions of men, how they just want to rewrite your word and destroy the truth. Father, help us to stay in your word, for your word is truth. And you are God, we're told they cannot lie. So we know that when we're saved, we're always saved. This morning, I don't know hearts, Lord, but I pray that you're working in every heart here today. The Holy Spirit convicting leading and directing and that no one would leave today until they deal with you whatever the need is in their heart i thank you lord for those who are out here this morning pray that you would work continually in their life giving them the joy that only comes through our lord and savior jesus christ and it is in his wonderful name that we pray